So we've got the Cummins in the 80 series, it's running, and now we wanna do lots of little things, including taking off the silencer ring on the turbo so we can get all that cool spool sound. It's relatively easy to take it off. You just have to get a flathead fine screwdriver and then remove the snap ring and then the silencer ring will come right off. So let's do it. So we got in there with a couple screwdrivers and we were able to pry the snap ring out of the race or the groove that it was in. And now we should be able to just pull this out by hand. Now we have our snap ring removed so we can remove the actual silencer ring itself. And there we go. Now we'll have all of the turbo whistles. So what we have here is the heavy duty high mount bracket from Jonesy's or Adventure Vehicles Northwest. Let's go through what parts come in the kit. First off, this is your AC bracket and we'll go over more how this fastens down to the side of the block in a minute. We also have our tensioner pulley. This is our water inlet and that will be sandwiched up against the lifting bracket and the thermostat. This is our water outlet or the lower portion and we need to fit our water inlet pipe from our heater core on the side. There is a machined port here on the side that this goes into. So we'll put some sealant, thread sealant on this and install that before we get it in the truck because this area here gets a little congested and it actually will contact one of the bolts holding the oil cooler in. This is the water outlet and I've selected the one and a half inch so that this will work with the Toyota radiator hose. I'll have to find a custom hose in order to route to the radiator, but this will make it work with the Land Cruiser. And then it'll come with zinc plated hardware as well. This is the tensioner mount plate and it goes on the front of the engine. So let's start installing it. First off, we'll start by applying some thread sealant onto the threads of this water inlet pipe from the heater core. Give it a nice smear. Make sure that all the threads are coated and thread it into this bracket. All right, so we've got our water inlet installed onto this bracket here, so we're ready to install this piece. First, we're gonna start by installing our tensioner mounting plate. It's two bolts that go into the front part of the engine here. And then we can install our tensioner pulley. This is indexed, so there is a little hole for the index pin on this tensioner pulley to fit into. And then on the back side, it's threaded so that the bolt can go through. All right, so now we have our tensioner mount installed and that will allow for operation of loosening this tensioner mount, which will allow the belt to slip on. Next part we have is our water inlet and this will go on the block facing here. We do need to put our lifting bracket in in case we need to take the engine back out. But before we put it in, in this little boss right here goes the thermostat. There's a little indexing pin that he's machined, I guess, into this, or maybe it just comes this way from factory. We'll align that with the thermostat, install it like this, pretty easy. Then we also have our gasket, which will sit just in here. And then we'll get ready to bolt this down, but we need to put our lifting bracket on this first. So we'll just kind of sandwich this all together. Get the bolts going through. And get this bottom bolt, which is a little bit shorter. We'll snug all these up. Now that we have our water inlet installed with our lifting hook, we have this upper AC mounting bracket. I'm not sure exactly what you'd call it, but this actually has three bolt holes that will accept this piece here. So we'll put our 10 mil fasteners into the threaded holes. He does note that you wanna have a little bit of play in this like this until you've got everything tightened down. So we'll leave it like that for now. Now we can install this lower alternator bracket and this is also the water outlet part of the bracket that we installed this coolant elbow. So this will go on with two different seals in this part right here, the outlet part of the block. 
There's a the little seal. So there's two seals in this part. One goes in right here like that, and it's just gonna probably fall out. Never mind. Yeah, so there's a seal in there, and there's also a seal that gets placed in here for your water outlet. And then this gets bolted on as one piece. It's all sandwiched in there. So we've got our seal in the block. We've got our seal placed in our bracket. So we'll go ahead and carefully put this on and start to get some of the bolts threaded through. All right, we've got our bolts installed so we can go ahead and start putting this up to the block. And there is one additional bolt that'll go inside the bracket itself down at the bottom. This is a little bit of a thicker bolt. So here we have our new Dodge uh, Denso style alternator, but we've already installed our external voltage regulator that was on the Toyota alternator. So it has the correct plastic plug here to plug back into our wiring harness. It's got the lead for your positive terminal or whatever that other part is from the harness. Basically, it's a bunch of little uh, Phillips head fasteners that secure this kind of Millennium Falcon thing on the back of the alternator. This one actually, it has the brushes in it from the original uh, Toyota engine and they're kind of bad. I'm gonna take them out and install a new one that I got for, it's like 15 bucks so that we don't have to worry about charging issues in the future. So it's just two little Phillips heads to take that off. So these are the old brushes and it's gonna be hard to see, but there's a little bit of breaking and the springs aren't really where they should be. So these brushes are going to probably wear out within 75,000 miles. So yeah, we could get some life out of them, but we have a brand new part here from Rock Auto and these brushes are a lot longer. The spring function on these works a lot better. So this is an easy fix for $15. So we'll bolt this in. All right, so the new brush is installed. Now we can install the back housing, but we'll go ahead and clean this up a little bit with some brake clean to get it looking nice. We've got it mostly cleaned up now, so we can go ahead and reinstall this. And this is one of the cool things about this swap is that this Toyota external voltage regulator fits right over top of the Dodge Cummins Denso. So we've got a few eight millimeter nuts we'll tighten down and then this is ready to install. So now that we've got our external voltage regulator installed, we can go ahead and install our alternator. Just like so. And there's a longer bolt which will go through this hole here with a nut on the back side. Then we have this additional mounting bracket that will go here, like so. And it's clearance to where it fits around the housing of the alternator. So this is threaded going into the upper bracket here. So we'll just loosely fit this bolt in. And then this will have a nut on the end of this bolt, which will pass through the housing of the alternator and this bracket itself. And we'll just loosely put that in. So everything's still pretty loose right now, which is what we want before we get our belt put on so we can check for everything and make sure that it's seated. So now we've got our AC compressor. Um, one thing that I noticed in the kit, the bolts were a little bit too long. So I went and got like five or 10 mil shorter this could be something that was my issue with purchasing this particular AC compressor, or it could have just been a, maybe a slight oversight on Adventure Vehicles Northwest. I always just assume that I'm wrong, so I'm gonna assume that I'm wrong, and maybe it's a different uh, AC compressor. So we'll get a couple of these bolts threaded through. We've also gone ahead and assembled our cooling fan with our fan hub attached to everything. We actually wanna clean that up, but in order to do that, we have to have it attached to the serpentine belt so that we can take it off easily because I don't have a means in order to get the uh, reverse thread bolt off. So now that that's tightened down, we can look at putting the belt on. We got the belt on. 
It's something that you probably want to do with another person as you're going to have to use a half inch breaker bar on this tensioner pulley to get the amount of belt needed to get over your water pump. But it's on and we've made quite a bit of progress as far as getting this bracket installed, making sure that everything's lined up. And I think it looks really good. It's really clean. This is a nice option if you're doing any swap really, but particularly with this 80 series. It kind of cleans up this whole area and allows for the plumbing of the intercooler and the water outlet pipe, which is a one and a half inch. So it'll plumb right into the Toyota radiator, which is nice. We do have to get a 1.75 or possibly two inch hose from this water inlet pipe. And it's gonna be a 90 here crossing over. We're gonna to have to see if we have interference with our oil fill tube and then it'll be a one and a half inch coming to the Toyota radiator. So this is a coupler coming from 1.75 inches to 1.5 inches, and this will make those different sizes work. Probably a good idea to buy two of these in case it fails for whatever reason, you'll be left on the track. So I made quite a bit of progress with the wiring harness. It's one of those things you just gotta take your time with. Obviously you want all of your power to go to places that needs power. So. I'll go ahead and B-roll this so we can get a close up. You're left with these two wires going into your cab. They're two white connectors. I believe this is going to be for our, one of our coolant temp sensors, only this one. And then this one will have the detent for the transfer case, as well as the starter and everything else. I've wrapped it in some friction tape and kind of left the leads where I can Y them to wherever they need to go in the engine bay once we get it all put in. But we are successful in wiring this. We are now turnkey to where you turn the key on and you have your fuel injection plunger going up from the fuel shaft solenoid. We took a hot wire coming from the ignition coil that would have gone on the igniter for the 1FZ for your spark plugs. I noticed that when I turned the key to the on position with a voltmeter, I was able to get 12 volts. So we just extended that wire back around the injection pump and now we have 12 volts going to the injection pump with the key on. And then we also have our starter wire extended from the back of this wire here, which I ended up cutting too short and had to solder it. This thicker wire right here is the wire for your park neutral safety switch, which goes into your Toyota transmission. And then there's a hot wire coming from it when it knows that the transmission's in neutral or park and it goes to your starter. So we won't allow it to start if you're not in park or neutral. We ended up just running a hot wire from this park and neutral safety switch on the back of the connector right into a spade connector, and this will go to the starter solenoid. So, a lot of success. We are able to turn the engine on and off with the key, which is exactly what we wanted. Other sensors I've left intact with the harness is this AC shutoff solenoid. I believe this is what this is. And like I was mentioning earlier, we got a new connector for our water temp sensor and I believe this will be for your dash. This is the large detent connector that is going to go to the transfer case for your vehicle speed sensor, etc. There is a ground here and I'm not sure if this is necessary 100%. I ended up trimming a lot of the wires for the ECU and I'm left with really only two and I'm not sure, I'm not clear whether or not I will need this ground, but we'll find that out soon. It wouldn't start with this before, but I've ground the chassis to the block and the block to the battery, so we should be good there. Finally, this is one yellow red wire that goes to somewhere around the alternator wiring. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but it is necessary to start. Now, in the engine bay, what we have with our alternator installed and we cleaned up the back part of the housing, are these signal wires coming from the harness on the battery side. There's three of them. So I've extended them to go around the radiator once it's in. I gave myself enough slack so that we can plumb it in nicely. And then also your charge wire. We went with some four gauge wire, heat shrank this so that it won't get hot and fray. That's going to the positive charge on your alternator. So that's all connected. Still left with trying to figure out AC and all that. We're gonna have to get some custom hoses made, but that's for a later time. I believe this electrical connector went to your AC unit in the Toyota, but we no longer have that obviously. And we have a Dodge compressor. So I forget how that works. We'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. 
Again, the wiring coming over top of the radiator once it's in, and we have a positive wire going into our harness here. So this is part of the harness that stays in the chassis. This is that electrical connector I was mentioning for the alternator, I believe. It's coming from the ECU area with the rest of the harness. We have our block and chassis ground. So one ground here is going into the battery here. We have all of our fusible lengths and everything that comes on the positive ends of the Toyota harness in the engine bay. And then this is the hot wire that would have been from the igniter wrapped around the injection pump going into the back of the fuel shutoff solenoid here. We've got one large wire, and this is like two aught, I think, going down to the starter, and that will be thick enough to start the vehicle and not have issues with burning up wire. Underneath here, and I should have installed this when it was out of the truck, is your AC shutoff solenoid. And then back here in this little brass fitting adapter is your water temp for your gauge. We were having issues with the oil pan clearing the track bar or the tie rod end. So what we've done is installed a 30 millimeter spacer on each side. In order to do this, you want to have a bottle jack underneath the frame on both sides and then employ two different jacks to lower the axle left, right, left, right until the axle is fully drooped. You do need to loosen this pan hard bar bolt in order to get your pan hard bar out because the whole axle assembly is gonna to wanna to sway left to right if you keep it in as you lift the truck. I also wanted to install those coil spacers because the extra weight of the Cummins is pushing down the stock springs that are 30 years old quite a bit. So we have quite a gap from our hub defender clearance right now, but this will end up working out for us positively in the long run as the springs begin to accept the weight of the Cummins. Issues we're still facing is the clearance between this intercooler piping here and the brake master cylinder. So that's just not gonna work. That's not enough room for me. Granted, the whole engine is falling back right now without the transmission attached, so it will level out. I still don't like that amount of clearance. So we are gonna go with the intercooler piping kit from Dustin. It's expensive, but it's the way to do it. It's the right way to do it. So instead of having this, it's going to come off and come back a little bit, go down through here, and then attach to the motor mount, go underneath the engine, and then just like in the white 80 series, we're going to cut holes here and here with a template, weld in some pipe for our intercooler piping, and then our intercooler will sit right here and be attached through the two pipes in here with rubber boots, and then come up to our turbo right here. Right now the engine's running rough because it's really rich. We're not getting enough air because our turbo's not hooked up. So once the intercooler piping is in, along with our silencer ring off, we'll have nice turbo sounds, the engine will be running cool, and we'll be getting boost. We've got our EGT sensor plumbed in and our wiring is going to be routed with the wiring harness on the back part of the firewall. Once we get our heater valve in and everything plumbed in, we'll zip tie everything, make it look like a million bucks. But for now, we're just going to mock everything up first. We gotta get the intercooler piping done as well as the exhaust. We're just gonna order an exhaust from Dustin. He makes an exhaust specifically for the 80 series Cummins build. So those are a few parts that we'll have in a few weeks here, as well as a rebuilt transmission. So we're spending a lot of money on this and it's starting to add up, but this is going to be a super clean build in a few weeks here. This is actually a really exciting stage of the build where it's mostly done. The engine's been built, it's in. We've got all our plumbing and our wiring, it's started but there's quite a bit of little things we need to patch up. So I'm trying to upload once a week to keep you guys all informed on what I'm doing. A lot of it's trial and error, making sure that things fit, like the intercooler piping. I tried to cheat and go the cheap way and try and fabricate my own intercooler piping, but would have had to gone through the fenders and I just don't like the way that would look. We're gonna do this right and make it look super clean. As always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you in the next one.